Hi, I'm Christian Shelton. I'm a professor of computer science at UC Riverside. Um, my research areas are in machine learning and uh, as a branch of artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'd like to talk today a little bit about what machine learning is and um, maybe a little bit how people who do machine learning do machine learning. So um, first of all, machine learning is related to a number of other topics. Um, data mining um, is sort of a uh, maybe a slightly different slant on the same idea. In fact, the whole field of statistics is in some sense um, the same as machine learning. Uh, the machine learning um, is the name that grew out of artificial intelligence for the study of how to use historic data um, to produce rules or to change what happens uh, how you act in the future. And if I can make a distinction among data mining and machine learning and statistics, um, and this is a gross caricature because really the three fields have much more in common than they have um, separate. Uh, machine learning is usually interested in um, statistical properties, but how to produce a rule that would then go into a system that would operate. Uh, data mining is interested in um, how would you do that efficiently using databases or things like this. Um, and statistics is usually interested more in um, some more sophisticated mathematical analyses um, that uh, often would support a human being. The term data science, I would say, is more general. It's the general uh, study, if uh, it's not well defined, but it's maybe the general study of anything sort of scientific or having to do with large amounts of data, and so machine learning would be a component, um, I would say, of data science. So what is machine learning, um, to me at least, um, and to many people? Well, it's a whole host of different problems and things. So it ranges from things like reinforcement learning that I will not uh, get into, which is how would you learn how to act if all you were given was, you know, carrots and sticks, but you weren't sure why, um, to general, like, discovery of rules and things like that. Um, but if I, the, the most common problem um, that people in um, machine learning look at, and the problem that's most heavily identified with machine learning, uh, is that of regression and that of classification, and particular methods for doing that. So let me see if I can illustrate the problem of regression first. So say um, I've been out in the field and I've measured things about hippopotamuses. Okay? So I've measured the girth of my hippopotamus and I've measured maybe how many times it wiggles its ears because these are important features of a hippopotamus, I'm sure you know. Um, and so I can view, sort of if I had a plane like this, yes, I can view each of those points as sitting on the plane. Right? So this axis might be the girth of my hippopotamus and this axis over here uh, might be uh, the number of times the hippopotamus wiggles its ears in an hour. All right. And then I've also measured, usually, a, an important other variable. So this might be the aggression of my hippopotamus. And if you've ever been near hippopotamus, you know that's an important thing to know. So this, is, this might be the height. So I have these points, yes, and now they each have a height to them, and they all stick up up here. So I have a, bunch of cl I have a cloud of points sitting in here. And the goal is, I want to produce a rule that predicts the aggression of the hippopotamus from the girth and the number of times it wiggles its ears. Because, of course, when I go out into the field and I meet a new hippopotamus, one I've not seen before, not one of the ones I've studied before, I can measure its girth, well, we'll assume I can do it from a distance, and I can count the number of times it wiggles its ears, and I want to know should I be able to approach the hippopotamus or not. So I have all these points up here, and I need a rule, I need a function that maps from this two-dimensional space up to a height. Um, so the, the typical way of doing this might be I pick a plane. So that is, I'm going to produce some plane like this, right? Um, and I can describe that plane by two parameters. You know, its slopes, well, a piece of paper wasn't the best choice. Its slope, um, you know, in this direction and its slope in this direction would describe that plane. So the, the plane is, this plane here is my answer to the problem, yes? Um, and it generalizes the points I had there. Right? I have a whole bunch of points, they give me specific values about specific hippopotamuses, and I want a general rule that maps um, for any future hippopotamus to its aggression. Now, that plane will not be exact. It will, be, it will not get everything exact, but it should be approximately correct. Okay. Um, so that plane has those two parameters that describe its slope. Those are called the parameters of my problem. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there are many ways of doing that. And often what they do is they look at, well, this is one plane, and I measure how much difference is there between the predicted point of this plane and the actual point I had for my hippopotamus. And this hippopotamus over here, and this hippopotamus over here, and this hippopotamus over here. And I sort of sum up all of those errors, and I try to find the plane, 
and by I I mean the computer, tries to find the plane that minimizes those errors. That is, it's a fit. And maybe if you've used a spreadsheet or so, you've been able to take a bunch of points and fit a line to them. It's the same idea here. Okay, so that would be the fit, and I try to minimize those errors. Um, in this case, I have two free parameters. I can rotate the plane this way, and I can rotate the plane this way. All right. Um, now, I don't have to use a plane. Um, I could use something else. I might use a quadratic surface like this. Pretend that looks like a parabola face on. I got a quadratic surface like this, and I can orient the quadratic surface, and I can bend it this direction. Yes, and that gives me three parameters. It's sort of tilt like this, tilt like this, and the sort of amount of curvature I have to this piece of paper. So now I have three free parameters, and that gives me more flexibility in fitting the points. And if I had a more flexible piece of paper, I might be able to produce, you know, uh, I can't quite do it, a cone or some other more complex shape that would have even more free parameters. So <clears throat> in machine learning, often, I will not say always, but often, you pick some sort of class of shapes like that you'd like to fit. Okay? And then you search the computer on you because it's tedious. You search over parameters that cause that surface to best match the points that you had. Now, there is um, a danger in this, right? So if I have, let's say, two points, I can definitely fit a line to them. But you may not have much faith in that line based on only those two points, because the two points probably have a little bit of error in them. And if I change just one of those points just a little bit, the whole line swings drastically. Yes. And if I have three points, I can easily fit a parabola to them, because a parabola has uh, three free parameters, and there are three points, and so I can fit that. And indeed, if I have too many degrees of freedom relative to the amount of data I have, then I can what's called overfit. So um, I can get a bunch of points, um, and I can get the, my, my, my newfound curve or surface to go exactly through those points, but off of those points it looks ridiculous. So here's an example of where I've taken a series of points, there are nine 10 points, and I fit a ninth degree polynomial to them, which has 10 free parameters. And you can see that it exactly fits all of those 10 points, and yet you would not probably consider this to be a very good generalization. That is, outside of those points where the data were, I don't believe this gives a good value because it overfits. It goes up and down and up and down all over the place. All right, um, so that's the problem of overfitting. It's that I have too many tunable parameters in my optimization problem relative to the amount of data I have. So for instance, in the same problem, if I have a ninth degree polynomial, but now I have a hundred data points, see, now it fits it perfectly fine. It wasn't the problem that a ninth degree polynomial was inherently a problem. It's that a ninth degree polynomial had too many degrees of freedom relative to the amount of data I had to estimate those degrees of freedom. So that's the fundamental problem of overfitting. And you try to avoid overfitting. And there are a great many ways to avoid overfitting, which are somewhat complex and technical. Um, but essentially, they involve trying to, let's say, penalize the use of parameters unnecessarily. Okay? So that is, when I'm fitting these things, I'm looking to see, well, could I fit them using fewer parameters, or using the parameters not as much, which is a little bit difficult, but can I, can I fit them using the parameters not as much? And if so, does it still fit okay? And if so, maybe I would believe that um, fit better. Okay. So an extreme example of a lot of parameters are um, neural networks. So this is a complex new model. Um, you can think of it as a series of these regression problems all chained together. So I have this input. Okay, um, and so they're usually drawn like this. So I have this input, okay, and it has a bunch of different features, right? And then from that input, I have a little regression problem that produces um, some other um, features. Basically, they're functions of the original input. And then from those, I have another regression problem that produces more features, etc., all the way until I finally get to the output. And this lets me construct very complex functions. So not just planes or simple parabolas or things like that. Um, but quite complex functions of the input, which are necessary sometimes to describe a phenomena, like um, I want to describe whether or not a particular patch of an image is a person or not. That's a fairly complex function. It's not just you take the average of the pixels values or something like that. So it's a very complex function. So I need all of these sort of degrees of freedom. However, the trick, the problem is with all of those degrees of freedom, I meant the risk of overfitting. And so there are two ways around this. The first is I I get a lot of data. So maybe I have 
a few thousand parameters. Well, if I have a few million data points, that is a few million examples of things that are faces and things that are not faces, then that might be okay to have that many parameters. Um, and the second is I apply some other methods that are called regularization methods um, to basically force my fit not to use the parameters more than it needs. So that's the general view of what's called supervised learning, or one of the basic problems in machine learning. Now, there's a problem with that. So the problem with that approach is that how do I know how many parameters I should use? Okay? Or alternatively, if I'm using one of these regularization techniques, how do I know what's too much parameter to use and what's not enough? So there are these, what are they called? There's, there are these these quantities that I can adjust. And if I adjust the quantity, I get a different answer out. I have the same data. I'm trying to fit the same kind of neural network or surface. But if I adjust one of these things like um, how many layers in my neural network, which dictates how many parameters, or I, I adjust something else, I will get a different answer out. Of course, I'll get a different function. Um, and so these quantities that I can tune in that way are called hyperparameters. They're not parameters of the final function that gets outputted, but they're parameters of the algorithm, the learning algorithm itself. These hyperparameters describe how many parameters there are in the resulting function, or these hyperparameters describe um, how much flexibility I should allow, or how much noise I expect in the data. Now, there's generally no way of knowing how to set those hyperparameters. Um, if I knew the problem perfectly beforehand, I knew exactly how images were created and, and what faces look like, I might be able to, in theory at least, mathematically work out what the correct values are for those hyperparameters. Uh, but in, in, in general, I don't know those sorts of things. So we set the hyperparameters and just hope things will work, kind of. But we need to set those hyperparameters, and this is an important part of all machine learning. And so to talk about how we set the hyperparameters, which are essentially discussing, you know, am I looking for a plane or a parabola? Am I looking for a neural network that has a thousand parameters or a million parameters? Am I, you know, these sorts of things. To set those, I need to describe a little bit of how machine learning works um, pragmatically. So the goal is to take this input data and to munge on it for a while and come out with a function. Okay. The goal of the function is not to predict that input data correctly. The goal of the function is to predict new examples. So if I have my hippopotamuses, I don't care about telling you how aggressive the hippopotamuses I've already seen are. I want to generalize to a rule that will tell me how aggressive a new hippopotamus will be. Okay. But as a machine learning practitioner, we don't have access to the future and what the future hippopotamuses will be. But I'd still like to know, is my machine learning method working? So what I will do is I'll take the past this data set I've collected about hippopotamuses, and I'll divide it into two chunks. I'll divide it into a training set and a testing set. And I'll use the training set as if that were the only data the machine learning algorithm can see, and the testing set will be kind of like these future hippopotamuses. Yep. So I will train my algorithm, I'll throw that training set, these, you know, maybe I have 100 hippopotamuses, I'll take 75 of them, and I'll make them the training set, and 25 of them, and I'll make them the testing set. And I'll take those 75 hippopotamuses and I'll throw them into my method and I'll get out a particular surface. This is the plane that best fits those hippopotamuses. And then for the 25 hippopotamuses that I saved, I will compare their aggressive values to the aggressive values that this function would predict for them based upon their girth um, and the number of times they wiggle their ears. And that will give me some sense of how accurate I would be if I used this method. And that's all fine and well, but then what about the hyperparameters? How do I set those hyperparameters? Um, it's tempting to say, well, I, let's imagine I have you know, a hyperparameter of how many degrees of freedom. Should I be a plane? Should I be a parabola? Something else. Well, I could try both a plane and a parabola and see how well those work on the testing data. That would be a nice thing. But now my testing data has become part of my training regime. Right? I'm selecting the resulting surface based in part on the testing data. So it's not truly testing data anymore. I have 75 hippopotamuses that are used to select, that are used to fit the plane, and 75 hippopotamuses that are used to fit the parabola, but then I pick whether or not I'm doing a plane or parabola based on the testing hippopotamuses, which is just another selection method of, of which thing to do. Just like I use these to select the angle of the plane, I'm now using these to select whether or not I should be a plane or hippopotamus. So I don't have a true independent testing set anymore. 
which is important to really validate whether or not this method is working. So, typically done, and should be done, is I take that training set of 75 hippopotamuses, and I divide it again. I maybe use 50 hippopotamuses for training, and I hold out 25 hippopotamuses for what's called a validation set. So now I have 50 hippopotamuses in training, so now I have a shrunk training set. 25 hippopotamuses in validation, and 25 hippopotamuses for testing. And what I do is I use those 50 hippopotamuses to fit the plane, I use the 50 hippopotamuses to fit the parabola, or any other set of shapes I'm interested in, and then the 25 in the validation set to select which of those shapes was better. And then after I'm all done with that, I have one shape, one, one true answer left, and I use that on those 25 testing set to get an estimate of how well my method would work in practice on true future data that hadn't been seen by any of the optimization method there. <clears throat> so those are the hyperparameters, and it may not sound that important on just picking between, you know, a plane and a parabola. Uh, but it's very important when I have lots of hyperparameters. So if you consider a full-blown neural network, it has lots of hyperparameters. Right? I'm taking this input signal and I'm pushing it through a series of layers. For each layer, I have questions about how many different features or pseudo-features should I be generating in that layer. I have questions about how I should be generating them, all sorts of things that I've gotten to. I have questions of how many layers I have. So I have all kinds of hyperparameters. And tuning those, you know, all these different directions, <clears throat> right, um, will give me different results out. Even if it didn't make any difference what those hyperparameters were, there'll be some statistically, you know, just some random difference in what the results came out as. And so by chance, by running so many different experiments, by chance, one of them will look really, really good, even if there's no um, fundamental reasons why it's good other than just random chance. And so I have to have that resulting testing set at the end to really validate that entire procedure. And that testing set has to have not been involved at all in any of the development um, of the final rule. Otherwise, I'm training on the testing set, which is sort of this uh, sin in uh, machine learning. So uh, that's an example of this division, this fairly fundamental division in machine learning between a training set and a testing set, and within the training set, sort of a, another training set, we don't have another good word for this, a, a sub-training set and a validation set. And the training set is used um, to uh, fit the parameters, and the validation set is used to tune hyperparameters, that is, even which method should be used on the training set, and then the whole result needs to be tested for, for validity on a separate uh, testing set. Another problem with machine learning is interpreting the results. So sometimes uh, we use machine learning uh, just to generate a rule that we let run. So, for instance, uh, we might generate a rule that predicts whether or not you will click on an ad, and that just runs as part of a big um, computational machinery inside of, let's say, Google to put ads up on people's pages. But other times we want to use the results of the machine learning and really look at it. So to go back to my uh, hippopotamus example, um, I might just be interesting is what causes aggression in hippopotamuses? And I've measured these things about hippopotamuses, and now I'd like to understand how that relates to regret, uh, aggression. And machine learning will give me some rule that will relate the two, and now I'd like to interpret that. So to explain some of the difficulties with this. I'd like to um, describe an example that I worked on. Um, it's actually an unsuccessful example of machine learning, but I think this will um, prove interesting. So um, I worked on patients in the intensive care unit, actually a pediatric intensive care unit. And when patients are in a pediatric intensive care unit, one of the many things that could actually uh, go wrong is they could uh, develop acute kidney injury. Acute mean comes on as suddenly a kidney injury, so that their kidneys uh, stop working properly. And this can be measured uh, by the amount of uh, creatinine in their blood. So one thing we might like to do is be able to predict the amount of creatinine in a patient's blood, let's say 24 or 48 hours from now. Okay? So how do we do this? Um, we uh, took, we measured, we, we, we went back to historic records of lots and lots of patients in a pediatric intensive care unit, uh, thousands of them, and we looked um, over, let's say, the first, I don't know, 24, 48 hours they were in the intensive care unit, and we um, built a bunch of measurements from there, let's say, um, how often they were taking particular drugs, um, what their blood pressures were, um, how much they, uh, how many different kinds of these procedures or those procedures happened. And we have this big list of different features. Um, including, for instance, their current creatinine levels in their blood. 
Okay. And then we also, because this is now historic records, can look at what their creatinine levels would be uh, 48 hours from now. Great. And now we just do this regression problem. Can I regress from one, the, this set of features onto the creatinine level 48 hours from now? But we're using this method of, of um, this hyperparameter that tries to force the machine learning method not to use too many of the original features. Um, because if I use too many of the original features, I have too many degrees of freedom, and I can definitely fit it, but I won't believe it. I'll be sure I'm overfitting. And so there are ways of uh, basically using this validation set to pick a hyperparameter that will tune down the number of features that are actually used for my regression. Okay, so we used this method, and it came back and it said, I have a pretty decent predictor. The creatinine level of a patient 48 hours from now is the creatinine level of the patient now. And we said, hmm, that's not very helpful. It may be true, but it's not very helpful. And indeed, you know, we kind of knew that. So the, the method through the cross -val through validation, validation set really did not want to add an extra feature. But you can sort of say, well, maybe it's, it's okay, add an extra feature. So we said, okay, go ahead and add an extra feature. And it said, okay, I have a second feature I'll add. That is, the creatinine level 48 hours from now can be predicted fairly well from the creatinine level now and whether or not the patient is on a nephrotoxic drug. Mm, nephrotoxic, damaging to the kidneys. I thought, that's, ex uh, that's excellent. But the sign of that dependence came in the reverse way. That is, this prediction says that if you are on a nephrotoxic drug, you are less likely to have acute kidney injury, which is interesting. It's not what you would expect. And indeed, um, this is where you need to interpret the models. This model is not cause and effect. It is correlation, right? It's not saying that that the current creatinine level and whether or not a nephrotoxic drug cause the um, creatinine levels 48 hours from now. It is saying that those things are related to the creatinine level 48 hours from now. And indeed, upon thinking about it, it was fairly clear why. This patient does not exist in isolation. This patient is in a hospital setting with doctors and nurses and other clinicians tending to the patient all the time. If the patient is currently on a nephrotoxic drug, it's actually a sign that that hospital system, the clinicians and the doctors, realize this patient is not at risk to develop um, kidney injury. If the patient were at risk to develop kidney injury, the patient would not be on a nephrotoxic drug. And so therefore, the presence of a nephrotoxic drug indicates this patient is less likely to get kidney injury. Not because the nephrotoxic drug prevents kidney injury, far from it, but because it's an indicator of something else that I have not measured in my system. Yep. So you have to be very careful in interpreting the results of, of machine learning um, because it's not, there's no notion, um, except for some fairly specific people who research this, but general methods do not address the notions of causality. They merely tell you about correlations in your data, and as we all know, correlation is not causality. So that was a quick overview of machine learning, some of the ideas and concepts that we use in machine learning and how we think about solving problems. I find this area fascinating. I hope you've enjoyed it as well.